and welcome to The Blunt Truth. I am your host, Jessica Tejada. On this show, we are going to have a blunt discussion, pun intended, on the use of marijuana, aka pot, weed, cannabis, herb, reefer, ganja. Is it really a harmful drug that leads to abuse and use of other drugs, or is it like alcohol, harmless if used occasionally and should be legalized for recreational use amongst adults? As for right now, recreational use of marijuana is legal in four states and Washington, D.C., but not in New York. While pot arrests have declined a lot in NYC because of the more lenient policies by the NYPD under Mayor Bill de Blasio, it is still against the law to smoke weed here. Meanwhile, New York just recently joined the roster of the states where medical use of marijuana is legal. You would think that with the legalization of medical marijuana, that New York has that New York was well on the way to legalizing recreational use of marijuana. Well, you thought wrong. In the upcoming election, it is reported that at least 20 states have recreational marijuana legalization on the 2016 ballot, and New York isn't one of them. For some, this is good news. For others, it's frustrating. For me, I won't say, but I will say that we are, to, we are going to present opposing views on this topic and let you decide. Let's start the discussion with someone who says, just say no. Hi. With me is juvenile offender specialist and youth counselor, Miss Corporal. Thank you for joining me. You're now welcome. you say, thank you. Now you say no to weed, why? Well, I don't know that I'm saying no across the board. Mm -hmm. I will say we need to take a closer look at the reasons and repercussions for legalizing weed. I think we need to look at um, the harmful or the potential for harm in terms of medical, mental health, um, legal ramifications, and those things. So I'm not necessarily saying no, but I do think we need to kind of zoom in more so on the legal side of things and on the possible consequences of um, recreational use. Because it can start as recreational mm -hmm. use and as we know, it's also called a gateway drug, which can also help, you know, propel you into using other more harder drugs that are harder to um, refrain or abstain from using. So I just have concerns about the recreational term. What does that really mean? Mm, uh, I got you. So are you against just youth using the marijuana or even adults? Well, I'm definitely against youth. <laughs> it, it, even if it's legalized, they're not supposed to be using it anyway, yeah. right? So... I mean, let's, because, you know, I could talk all day about that. Even with adults, I think, you know, can we really mandate or, or have adults, you know, do like a screening process before yeah. they use it? I mean, if we have an adult who has mental health issues and now they're not taking their prescribed medication because they feel like they can use weed and it's somehow relaxing them or, or minimizing their symptoms, then I have a problem with that. But how do we look at that as a, as a society, as a, whoever's dispensing it? Are they going to do that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I have concerns about all of those other variables, and I have real concerns about the percentage of people that actually use it for recreation and how many people use it for medicinal purposes when they really need mental health treatment or other forms of medical help. So you're saying you're for the medical um, use of marijuana. What are your thoughts on I, it? I'm s well, my thoughts on medical, you know, it's like, it's a business, mm -hmm. you know, like all pharmaceuticals are businesses. Yes. And we know that a lot of times things are overprescribed, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's, it's weighing, out the, weighing out the issues, looking at what are the underlying reasons why we want it. Now, if the government wants this legalized, they are benefiting from this, right? Mm -hmm. there, there has to be a revenue stream that they're going to benefit from because they, be, they wouldn't look at it this way. So I'm always looking at the why, and I'm always looking at the underlying issues about why is this an important topic at this particular time? Because we do know that there are harmful effects to marijuana. We know that mm -hmm. um, in terms of youth, even, even adults, short-term memory loss. We know that um, mental health issues are exacerbated as a result of using them. I mean, we have some real data to justify why yeah. it's, it's not a good thing, right? So why then are we pushing forward with this? It's, it's a reason why the government is, is really looking at this. So, um, so I, I'm not, you know, I'm not like on this bandwagon of let's not do anything. I'm saying yeah. let's look at it and look at how it's going to harm 
potentially our society, mm -hmm. or is it really going to help? How is it benefiting us? Either way. Um, you mentioned that uh, you said that the government is obviously going to benefit from us. Do you have um, any idea of how they're going to benefit if it? Um well, they're going to tax it. They're mm -hmm. going to they're going to tax it. So now when somebody buys it, it'll be a part of. <laughs> You know, the same way we go into CVS yeah. and we buy deodorant and Tylenol, mm -hmm. it'll be the same thing. It'll it'll become a part of our, you know, our revenue stream yeah. and how the, the government makes their money. So if not, why else would we be talking about this? Mm -hmm. um, if marijuana were legalized, there would be certain regulations on the drug. For instance, there would probably be a cap of the amount of THC. Um, you know, the bad stuff mm -hmm. um, that's put in it. Mm -hmm. Would smoking be, be okay then if they were to diminish it? Well, the people that smoke now that are for marijuana becoming legalized, um, they're probably going to buy more of it. I mean, you know what I mean? They're going to get, they, they're going to want the high that they're used to. So they're probably going to buy more. So you're saying the THC was to be down, people will actually buy more, bigger amounts because there's not right. that much. Right. Okay. If you're used to a certain high, right? Mm -hmm. So now, if I go to a bar for happy hour and, and one drink is not what I wanted it to yeah. be, now I'm going to buy two or three. It'll be the same thing. It wouldn't be any different. So they're going to diminish it. They're going to try to regulate it. And people are going to get around it the way they always have. We have, I don't know, 80% of youth that smoke mm -hmm. weed. They're not even supposed to have access to it. Right? Yes. So I then they lose it. their motivation to go to school and, and a lot of things begin to decline and... All of these regulations that's supposed to be in effect that, that aren't working now, they're really not going to work when it becomes legalized. Very, make an excellent point. <laughs> um, um, as I mentioned earlier, under the leadership of Mayor Bill de Blasio, marijuana possession has been um, decriminalized. Um, as a juvenile offender specialist, have you found there to be a um, significant uh, drop in arrest among youth for marijuana possession? I haven't had many youth that came into my care or custody because of marijuana um, possession or, or sale. Mm. That's a misdemeanor, and it wouldn't necessarily warrant. Oh, so for youth is not... It's a misdemeanor. To okay. s the, the, the personal use of marijuana is considered a misdemeanor. For youth? Probably for adults, too. It's, it's, it's considered a, a misdemeanor. So, you know, when, when I, the kids that I work with... Mm -hmm come into um, placement with, with me when they they have done other things. Oh, has nothing. More, more, you know, you know maybe robbery yeah. or whatever. And then, of course, when you begin to talk to them, we, they all have that as a common denominator. They smoke. Oh, okay. Right? But I that's see not it. what got them to me. I, I haven't heard of anybody say, oh, I smoke so much weed, now I'm going to go beat somebody up. You know, it just, if anything, they want to go somewhere and sleep or eat. Oh, so you don't feel that. Uh, it's not. Marijuana leads to violence. Like I haven't, I, I, I haven't made that correlation based on who I've worked with. What I have seen, mm -hmm. and what I don't like about it, about the effects of it on the youth, is that, um, you know, it has this effect of really bringing the energy level down and the motivation yeah. down and the memory lapses and it's just everything is sort, of, everything is sort of like just even. There's no up and down with your mood. It's just sort of like. And I feel like line. it has a masking effect. Yeah. So what happens is if I have an issue and I'm smoking, you know, then whatever issue I had, it's just like everything is good. I'm all right. I'm chilling out. I'm relaxing. I'm going to eat some Cheerios because, you know, the munchies <laughs> and all of that. So, you know, it's just, yeah. and that's the problem I have. You're not really dealing with whatever you need to deal with. So how do we, how do we go from this being recreation to finding out who's using it that really mm -hmm. could use help in another area. See, that's that's my concern. Okay. If I thought it could stay at recreation, yeah. I might be smoking it. But if I thought it would stop me from working efficiently, having the motivation I need, the energy I need, or from dealing with my problems head on like I need to as an adult responsibly, then I have an issue with it. And that's my issue with it. Wow. That's, um, I like, like your points. I like them. Um, um, so uh, two years ago, the NYPD um, was ordered to stop arresting people for marijuana possession mm -hmm. um, and instead issue civil uh, citations. Mm -hmm. um, yet over 16,000 people were arrested last year for marijuana, marijuana possession and nearly 90% of them were black and Latino. On top of this, it is reported that arrests for marijuana possession um, for the first five months 
of 2016 are up 22% um, from the same period of last year. Several bills were introduced to address this um, problem, but none passed. Um, a fix to this problem would be to legalize marijuana for adults and regulate it like alcohol. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? You said that the arrests are up 22%? Yes. And that the population that's being arrested are black and Latino? Yeah. Now. Go ahead. <laughs> we know <laughs> that our community, and I'm, I'm taking ownership, okay. right? Our community mm -hmm. and the police don't have a great relationship. Yes. So taking weed out of it, just, just the, we didn't even got to talk about weed to know that, you know, we just don't have a good relationship with the police right now, and, and that's our, you know, one of our issues. So anytime I see arrests and whatever, I mean, we can always question and go back and forth and debate, was it really weed? Was it because they want the mess with it? You know, it, you know the, our relationship and the reputation of the police and the, you know, everything that we've seen, we, we know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, the numbers generated by NYPD, they don't, they have no validity for me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you don't feel it's accurate. Yeah, I don't know if it's accurate. I don't know who who did the numbers. Yeah. I, you know, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm against police. I'm saying that what we've seen has not been favorable for yeah. our young people, our black men and women. So, you know, you know I'm not feeling them right yeah. now, if I can say it that <laughs> way, yeah. I get what you're saying. Um, so, um, so if it was legalized only for adults and regulated like alcohol, would you still, like what are your thoughts with it still? Well, it's still, some of the issues still remain the same. Okay. You know, we still, we have adults um, who, who still have mental health needs that mask with drugs, not only just, just marijuana. So I just want to know what's going to be the screening process. How's it going to be dispensed? I need to know more. Mm -hmm. You know, because right now we're talking about the pros, the cons for recreation. Uh, somebody's benefiting from this, money-wise. Somebody's benefiting from this. I just need to know, well, what are the motivations for this? I, I, I get what you're saying. So um, if they were to legalize weed, what do you think should be the age limit? Before you answer, keep in mind, the age to vote is 18 years old. Um, the age to drink and smoke in New York is 21. Mm -hmm. The age of sexual consent in New York is 17. Mm -hmm. And in New York, 16 and 17 year olds can be tried as adults, and I know you said the issue you want more details, but if you were to get mm -hmm. more details and this was presented, what, what do you what feel? What the age? Yes, yeah, should be? be the age limit. If you had more details, more Well, I guess know. I would put it along, I would have it parallel the age to drink, the legal age to drink, 21. 21? Yeah. Why is that? Just, I just mean. Just because. I just mean, I, I, you know. Just they're going to get it. Yeah. I, I mean, if I just had to pick it out the air, I would be let 21. it parallel whatever the, the legal age for drinking is, which is 21. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the main concerns is that marijuana use among the youth will increase if legalized. As a youth counselor, um, what have you found to be the cause of marijuana use amongst teens? I find that, um, first of all, it, it's, it's some cultural components to it. And okay. our culture seems like it's just everybody smokes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it, it really is just that way. I, I work with many, many clients, and all of them smoke. I don't think I've had a client that does not smoke weed. Wow. Honestly. So I believe part of it is cultural. I believe um, part of it is a way of dealing with issues in society, issues, home issues. But, you know, it's a way of masking concerns that need to be addressed, either it's mental health, physical all kind of things. It's, it's so many reasons that that they use that people use drugs on whole, and youth typically use them because a lot of times they have deficits, developmental deficits, and so they smoke so they don't have to deal with certain things, so or it helps them relax so that yeah. they can do some things. Like I've had, you know, you say, you know, I smoke because. I could relax, I could just, you know, I got so much on my mind, and then I want to say, well, what are you so anxious about? We mm -hmm. need to deal on, on your anxiety, we need to work with your anxiety, not smoking to mask it, because then you never get to why you were so yeah. anxious. So, it's that kind of thing. Oh, so it's like a coping mechanism, kind of, basically. Absolutely, which can lead to addiction. 
which is a way of becoming addicted to something. Because you're not dealing with it. You're gonna you life is gonna happen. Yeah. Right. That's so what you gonna true. do? You're just gonna keep smoking. <laughs> yes. you know, like life is gonna happen. It, it's gonna things are gonna happen. You have to learn how to have developed coping mm -hmm. mechanisms so that you can deal with things. So you don't have to smoke. So that smoking would be recreational then. True. It's not recreational when you're yeah. smoking because you're trying to deal with something. It's something else. So you do feel it's an addictive? Um, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know nobody. I don't know anyone who smokes just for recreation. People that smoke, smoke every day or, or more than once a week. <laughs> I don't know anybody who can just say, oh, I'm going out. I'm going to have a drink I'm gonna ha I'm gonna, and I'm going to smoke. No. When they start mm. smoking, it becomes in habit. I don't know. I don't know anybody. Mm. Now, I could be wrong. No, of course. But... But everybody, as everybody that I know, personal and professional, mm -hmm. when they begin to smoke, they smoke pretty regularly. So that's not recreation for me. I, I get what you're saying. Cool. Um, um, have you ever smoked? Absolutely. As a teenager. I'm 43 now. I mean, I don't smoke now. Yes, I have. And I didn't like, I liked the high, but what I didn't like was it made me eat. And I've always been chunky. And that wasn't for me. <laughs> Oh, that's the truth. That's the main that's reason. The re that's the only reason. So um, if it didn't give you that uh, effect, would you say right now as the woman you are, would you still have continued? No, because then I would have, at, at 16, it was some peer pressure related. It was some mm -hmm. home things going on. It was a lot of stuff going on. Where I, too, was using it to sort of just not deal with things. So, you're, so you kind of understand the oh, youth that you did. That's oh, why you're it. not as. I get it. Yeah, okay. I get it. I get it. I don't necessarily agree with it. I get it. You get it. Yeah, and when I counsel youth, I don't tell them not to smoke. I let them see or try to highlight for them what it's costing them when they do. I don't tell them don't smoke. I say, well, you know, when you smoke, you see, you don't get to school. Mm -hmm. You don't get to finish your homework. You smell bad. You get this, whatever. <laughs> no, I just tell them what. No, what I know. It's just it's amazing. Yeah. Everything you say is, it's, you yeah. know. I, I, just, I just highlight for them what it's costing them. And if they're on probation or parole, mm -hmm. On probation or parole, you're not supposed to smoke. If you if you go to do a urine analysis yeah. for drug testing, they're going to lock you up. But if that's it worth it for you, then that's up to you. I don't tell them don't smoke. I just lay out for them what it's costing them. And if it's worth it, then you continue that's to smoke. Be it, yeah. Wow. Well, um, mm -hmm. I think that's about it for today. Thank you so much um, for your time. Uh, yeah, I, I really honestly enjoyed this. Uh, well, this is Jessica, and this is the uh, Blunt Truth. Okay. okay, that was definitely the Blunt Truth. Joining me next is someone who is for the medical use of marijuana. All right, thank you for uh, being here, Fred. So uh, tell us what is it you do and what's your involvement with pharma pharmacinists. So I operate a company called Polsonelli Public Affairs based here in New York City and we handle a lot of the lobbying, public relations, public affairs, business development, uh, and deal making for pharmacanists here in New York. Okay. Um, what was the process of uh, getting, I guess you could say, the business started? Yeah, so the um, state of New York issued an RFP last summer to um, cultivate and dispense medical cannabis. At that time, 43 companies from around the United States applied. There was a 30-day window to turn in the application. And um, fortunate for pharma canis, they were actually scored first by the mm -hmm. New York State Department of Health and received one of the five licenses here in New York. Oh, that's, that sounds pretty cool. Um, how, how is it made, like, the, um, not the business per se, but, like, to... The, um, the product itself. The product itself, yes, The product thank you. itself is, is traditional marijuana, like you've seen around the country mm -hmm. or on television. It starts with a seed, it turns into a nice <laughs> plant, you pick the buds, and then you turn that into medicine. There's no smoking in New York. It's all, it's all oil-based, mm -hmm. and so that, that oil is created at the cultivation centers, which in Pharmacan's um, situation, it's in Orange County, New York. Okay, so your, where's your location now of so your... So our, our cultivation center is in the town of Hamptonburg, which mm -hmm. is in um, Orange County. And that's where you grow the... That's where okay. we grow. We actually have about 135,000 square foot wow. greenhouse facility. Yeah, it's massive wow. and it's <laughs> the first of its kind in Orange County, that's for sure. And uh, we have uh, dispensary locations in the Bronx, okay. up in Albany, Buffalo, and Syracuse. Oh, so you have three locations, uh, not four, just... Four total four. plus the grow facility. Each license holder is responsible for the growing and the dispensing of the medical marijuana. Oh, um, can yeah. you give us a description of what a uh, pharmacanist looks like inside? 
uh, what the cultivation center looks like? Yeah, like which is just a. I like can I can promise you that um, if you were to see what our cultivation center looks like and also what our dispensaries look like, the first thing out of your mouth would be, "This is not what I expected." That is what <laughs> everybody says when you walk into our dispensary mm -hmm. location. It looks more like a high end physician's office. Okay. Um, like with the waiting room and yeah, stuff. Yeah, like it's a very therapeutic type feel. This is not what you see in Colorado. It's not what you see in California. There are no jars with marijuana <laughs> on the counter. There's yeah. nothing green. Uh, there's nobody wearing a tie-dye shirt. That's not what this is. This is strictly, <laughs> yeah. strictly medical play. It's a very mm -hmm. sophisticated uh, professional operation. So I would invite you at any time to come to our Bronx yes, location. Yes, of course. I we would love to. We could do a walkthrough. Yes. And um, you will feel like you're, like I said, you're in a high-end physician office or a spa type feeling. A it's, spa, It's wow. very therapeutic, you know, because, again, we're counseling very sick people. Okay. I mean, people who are coming through our doors looking for product are not... Uh, folks who stub their toe that morning yeah. and they have a little bit of pain. These are people with cancer, HIV, ALS, MS, Parkinson's. Um, these are people that are taking numerous pills mm -hmm. every day. You know, these are people who are on opiates okay. um, and medical cannabis has proven to reduce uh, the prescription pill intake and also reduce the opiate intake. So that's a big deal. As we move forward throughout this program, people are going to start to realize that medical cannabis will literally substitute potentially dozens of pills that yeah. sick people are taking on a weekly basis. Oh, so you're saying the medical, um, the medical cannabis is, so all the pills they're taking, just one, um, I guess, dose of the medical cannabis is going to override well, it depends. It, it depends on the patient and the ailment, of course. But in general, what we're seeing happen is folks with, let's say you have cancer, mm -hmm. you take a handful of, of pills, unfortunately, to get you through your chemotherapy. We're seeing that individuals no longer have to rely on those pills, the traditional forms of meds, when they're now substituting the medical cannabis. The medical cannabis is just as effective, if not more effective, with no side effects. Mm -hmm. There's no potential for o overdose. Um, and so it's a much safer product, and it's a much more... Uh, it's becoming a much more accepted product oh. because again we're not talking about smoking a joint yeah um, we're course. literally talking about creating world-class medicine that happens to come from a plant that happens to have yeah. a stigma attached to it um and 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 you should take a look for yourself at where that stigma came from yeah um and how it came about um at one point in this country you could get medical cannabis on mm -hmm. the shelves of your local Dwayne Reed or different CVS uh, department store drugstore type of Are you saying as of right now I can go to No, but back in oh, okay. 100 years ago you could. So back then I could walk to um like a Rite Aid yeah. and there'll be marijuana yeah. in in wow. its form for that era, yes. Wow, it was socially <laughs> acceptable because again we're not talking about smoking anything. We're, yeah. we're talking about creating an oil that goes into a capsule from a plant. The plant's marijuana. It's a controversial plant, but it's a plant. This is not a new form of science here. We're just sort of resurrecting it in America now. Kind of like the fish oils? Because I'm trying to picture yeah, like a, oils in a pill, so I'm trying to like... It is, a like a like a, it is a lot okay. like a fish oil. It is a lot like a fish oil. Okay. Um, if you were to put a fish oil pill next to a medical marijuana capsule, it, looks the same. it would look the same. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, oh. yeah. I read that tinctures um, or extracts uh, contain a lot of THC. The harmful, the harmful stuff. So why is this being dispensed as opposed to smokable marijuana? Considering majority of the data mm -hmm. on the soothing effects of marijuana comes from examining the effects of smoking dried buds. That's not exactly true. Okay. So tinctures. So so you can manipulate the ratio of THC to mm -hmm. CBD for any of our products, right? Whether it's the oil or you, you want to use a tincture or a vaporizer or a capsule. So t we make tinctures and companies make tinctures that have you know. Um, one to two ratio or 50-50 where um, you have half THC, half CBD. Some are higher CBD, some are lower CBD. Okay. So you can really manipulate how much THC and CBD is in any given product. And the tincture is, uh, you know, that, that proves true for the tincture. How much so percent would it be in the tincture? I mean, it depends on whatever okay. the company wants to make. Uh, you know, some companies make a higher THC mm -hmm. branded uh, tincture. Others keep the THC lower. It, it really, it depends on um, what the patient wants, and so we have to make product that will support the entire market, essentially. So it's with the with the patient wants. So it's not like say like the doctor uh, prescribes like you need about fifteen percent. It's what the patient wants, or what well, the doctor recommends. If the pa like we may have a patient that is doesn't want any THC, 
They don't want to feel high. They don't want that sense of whatever that sense is. So they go into the dispensary and they say, look, I'm very sick, mm -hmm. but I do not want to feel this at all. I don't want that feeling of euphoria or being mm -hmm. high. And so in that case, we would give them a tincture or a product with very high CBD rate. And we would keep the THC level very low. Oh, okay, okay. Others, it's it. not the case. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, unfortunately, we've seen folks who are going through chemotherapy mm -hmm. and they need something to just take their mind off of what's going on. And a lot of times that, in that situation, we would look for a product with, with some levels of THC. In wow. It. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. It all comes down to the consultation between the pharmacist and the patient. Oh, you know, that's so that's because you guys work with the patient. Oh, you would not believe how we work with the patient. <laughs> it really is. That is the difference maker between what our program mm -hmm. is and what I think a traditional um, pharmacy type situation yeah. is. You know, if you, you know, if it, again, the people coming into our dispensary are beyond sick and they're caregivers. Wow. So when they come in, it's a very serious conversation. We're talking about, you know, adding meds to their repertoire that they haven't usually, uh, they're not accustomed to. So, you know, we have to, to, to consult them, and mm -hmm. that's what we do. And we take our time. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not like they hand our, our, our pharmacist a prescription and the, pr the pharmacist just writes a script yeah. or whatever and gives them the pill. That's not what this is. You know, it's a, it's a really in-depth conversation. Like a one-on-one, on one, they, that's yeah. good. Yeah, it has to be. Has to be. Yeah. People don't understand what this industry is yet. They, a lot of people don't understand what the product is yet. Well, that's so why we have you here today. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm learning as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's th there are very few experts mm -hmm. um, in New York when it comes to this space right now. Oh, just in New York, but other places well, you feel there's the a little bit more. Well, the West Coast is ahead of the game. Really? Know, and, well, they've been doing this for, uh, medical marijuana mm -hmm. has been more accepted on the West Coast over the years. And yeah, I think the I East Coast that. is just starting to wake up to yeah. what's going on. I mean, I see with my own eyes how this product helps patients. And for that reason, mm -hmm. is that that's why this industry will only continue to grow and flourish. Because it's not, a, it's not BS how it affects the patients. It's real. I mean, we're seeing in states right now, this is real fact. Yeah. We're seeing in states that have had a medical marijuana program for two or three years, they're seeing a 40 or 50% reduction in accidental opiate-related deaths. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, let's be the real The numbers here. are pretty, pretty you know, good. You get into a car, you know, you're a regular person, you know, whatever, you work, you go to school, whatever you do, you're a good person. You get into a car accident, you hurt your knee, you're in pain, you go to your doctor who you've known for 30 yeah. years, your doctor gives you a 30-day supply of Oxycontin, even though... The the human body is only supposed to be on a pill like that for a week or so. I yeah. heard. Um, you go through the 30 day allotment, you're still in pain. Mm -hmm. You go back, you get another 30 day allotment. Unfortunately, yeah. what's happening months down the road is um, folks are turning to a cheaper form of um, self medication in heroin. And that's why we're seeing wow. a heroin epidemic because it starts with opiates. Nobody will dispute that. That's real. So we have a mission, which is to get medical cannabis into the marketplace to help combat that opiate and heroin issue. We think we're going to see that in New York. I know the state just spent uh, upwards of $200 million to wow. fight the heroin <laughs> epidemic. That's good. We have the answer in front of us right here. Wow, that's really good. Wow, that's very good information. That's <laughs> unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. People don't realize that yet. Yeah. But it's going to continue to get bigger and take the spotlight because... It's hard to dispute those facts. You know, the University of Michigan School of Medicine mm -hmm. came out with a report about a, a two months ago stating that this is the case. So it, it, people will not be able to ignore this fact. It's not going to happen. Um, okay, so I'm going on to the next question. Yeah. Uh, what is the price range for these forms of marijuana? So it's cash only. It's not covered by insurance. It's so not covered no by insurance. Medicaid. No insurance, unfortunately. It's, it's still private. federally legal. Okay. And so that's why um, we're unable to use credit. We're unable to mm -hmm. use insurance. So right now the product ranges from anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to a little bit more or wow. a little bit less. Yeah. So you would say... <laughs> As far as like a hundred being the minimum, or like like it depends. It depends on the amount and it okay. depends on the type. But yeah, we're looking at um, roughly for a month supply or starting around mm -hmm. that that dollar figure. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay, so I guess we'll skip this question. Um, so who qualifies for medical marijuana in New York? Um, you have to have one of the ten qualifying diseases. Which? So cancer, okay. ALS, MS, Parkinson's, neuropathy. Um, HIV, AIDS, um, and then a couple more. That are oh, yeah, there's right a whole now. bunch. Okay. There's two more, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, but those are the main ones. Yeah. It's MS, ALS, Parkinson's, HIV, cancer, uh, neuropathy. 
Ver and diseases that are strictly are um, that are heavy in the neurological side. Wait, hold on. We just this is not. No, yeah. Um, I can't think of the other two. Well, there was some some re something I read that um, anxiety, but like a no, because no, no. I read that somewhere. Not in New York. Oh, not in New York. Not okay, in New York. So. Other states though are, are much looser. I mean, okay. Um, you know, especially recreational states. But you know. in New York, it has to be like a really. You're really okay. sick. Yeah, you're you can't fake your illness in New York. Yeah, in of California, course. everybody's got a medical card, right? Because you you stubbed your toe, so you go get a med <laughs> medical marijuana yeah. card. That does not happen here. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, um, or for you know, however you want to look at it, yeah. the, the folks are really sick. It's really, it's really sad. Okay. Um, is Epilepsy. There, yeah. That's the big one. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna actually mention that. So, um, is there an age limit? Um, no. No. Really? Pediatric epilepsy is one of the major ailments that uh, is combated by medical marijuana. So, like I said before, we, what I saw a twelve-year-old have a seizure right mm -hmm. in front of me. It changed my life. And her parents were hysterically crying, saying that we need medical marijuana. We don't want to move out of our home. We don't want to move overseas to keep our daughter alive or keep her quality of life as high as it can possibly be. We need medical marijuana. We don't want to give our 12-year-old daughter 100 pills a day. Of course. That's not what we want to do. And I've seen her, her, her daily rate of seizures has gone way down wow, since she started taking that's this. That's beautiful. It's so either a so coincidence or it's not. And yeah. I'm you, it's not a coincidence. So would you say that even an infant could even? Um, I, nobody's ever asked me that question. Really? I don't think so. I mean, I don't, I don't, just like you wouldn't give infants Well, because you said, you men. said HIV, so I know yeah. there are babies who are born with that. So I'm saying, sure. is there an age limit with that? Or do I, you think? I don't think. I can't answer that. Okay. I don't know. I have only, I, the the youngest I've heard yeah. are, you know, 12, 13 year olds. 12, that's the youngest. 10, 11. You know, okay. And that would be under the, um, under pediatric epilepsy. Oh, so you have um, pediatricians there as well. Um, we don't have pediatricians in our dispensary. Okay. We have pharmacists in our dispensary, but the doctors who would prescribe the recommendation mm -hmm. to the patient would be pediatricians or, you know, in the, in the case of epilepsy, it would be a neurologist or, um, a pediatric neurologist. Oh, that's interesting. Um, can any doctor prescribe medical marijuana? They have to be certified. So if you're a physician, you have to go on the New York State Department of Health website, you have to take a course, and then you become certified. At the point you become certified, you can then uh, recommend medical cannabis to your patients and, and others. So if, um, say, if I was to just, you know, get one of those chronic illness and I go to my regular doctor, they cannot prescribe, they have to practice They have to get certified. Okay. And that's a little bit of the bottleneck right now because that's happening every day. Yeah. Um, educating physicians is very important and mm -hmm. physicians have been working um, in a certain format for many, many years and a lot of times they're reluctant to look at new medicines. A lot of the ones, a lot of them are looking at the new meds because they hear from their patients yeah. that it works. So they feel a duty to get certified. But um, it's taking, you know, it's gonna take a little bit of time to get many, many, yeah. many, many, many more physicians certified. It's happening. Some would say it's happening slow. I don't think it's happening slowly. Okay. I, I think it's happening actually at a pretty decent pace. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's going to continue to grow um, at, a, at, a, at a quicker pace as we move forward because there's going to be more and more spotlight. And I think we're going to see a domino effect. As more patients and physicians enroll, word will continue to spread, and then it'll just only get better. Oh, interesting. Um, so I read an, um, an article titled, How New York Totally Screwed Up Legalizing Medical Marijuana. Basically, it points out how New York's medical marijuana law is the most restrictive. Who wrote I, that article? Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? My thought is somebody <laughs> wrote that article with an ax to grind. I think it's crazy for people yeah. to be overly critical about this program. I've seen it help people. Now, mm -hmm. we're talking about building a brand new industry in the state. Brand new. We got to educate everybody. We gotta, we got to educate the public. We got to educate patients, doctors, everybody. We have to staff these facilities. We have to build these facilities. Yeah. There's never been a hundred and thirty-five thousand square foot marijuana greenhouse in Orange County, New York. Of course. This is all brand yeah. new. It just started in January. So <laughs> yeah, of course. In January. Okay? Oh, this year. This year. Okay. We're not even open in the Bronx yet. We're putting the final touches on it. We're going to open. Oh, in you're the next not few open weeks. in the Bronx. We're not. We're there. We're staffed. Oh. But we're going through sort of. Some some of the standard um, retail location issues um, that people deal with in New York City, which is just, you know, working with the different yeah. agencies and getting it off the ground. But there are no hang-ups. It's just got to take its, its course. Um, is so it restrictive? Yeah. I don't think so. It's, it, it, it's, it's so sensitive that mm -hmm. it has to start small, and then we can expand from there. You don't mm -hmm. want to start too big. So 
Could the state have included more ailments? Sure. Yeah. Could they have added more dispensaries? Sure. And I think in due time they will, but it's got to grow at the right of pace. Course. Um, so I would love for the person who wrote that <laughs> article to pull up a chair and we can have a conversation okay. about why they're saying what they're saying. So, okay, um, so we interviewed someone from COM. Um, it's an organization, it's called Citizens Against Legalizing Marijuana. The organization is against all forms of marijuana use, recreational and medical. Um, on their site, they have an article that talks about the harmful effects of marijuana, citing that is it causes it causes brain damage, cancer, mental illness. Well, crime. somebody said that marijuana causes cancer. Yeah, violence and DNA damage. What are your thoughts on this? It's an organization that's obviously against medical and so. I'd love to see the data of somebody saying that marijuana causes cancer. That's that's a new one for me. Um, I can't speak to the recreational side. I've got nothing to do with the recreational market. I don't get involved in the states out west. Mm -hmm. um, this is strictly a medical play. Yeah. Um, but they also have I can tell you that no medication is perfect, okay. but I can tell you that medical marijuana for the things that it treats seems to be more effective and better for the patient than the current traditional meds that they may be taking uh, beforehand. Now that's a big statement. Um, so you don't agree with the fact that what they, you know, what they state about the brain damage, the mental illness, the crime, I think violence. What's, we're, I think we're, as a society, we're mm -hmm. faced with the issue of what's the best medicine available. Of no course. medicine's perfect. Of course. Oxycontin's not perfect. No. It's not 100% harmful. It's good for what it does in a, in a small period mm -hmm. of time. It works. But um, I think you, you can't take the attitude of, you know, is this good or is this bad? It's what's best for the patient. And if you have cancer and you consider medical marijuana a more helpful treatment than taking some pill that's going to dope you up and drown you out mm -hmm. and make you go to sleep for the end of your life, then why should you not have access to medical cannabis when it's legal in New York? So um, I just, I, I, I think it's crazy <laughs> to think that. Yeah, that um, I would listen to the patients and their families, quite okay. honestly. The patients and their families are used to taking pills, dozens of pills a day. Mm -hmm. Now many of them are strictly taking medical cannabis. and I'm not saying their pill intake is going away, but it's being reduced. Of and course. I think that that's a great thing. And I don't know how you can say that yeah. that's bad. Again, I, I would lean on the patients. Um, as to the recreational side, yeah, I, I don't, you know, you I think that there's a lot to be studied there. So do you feel marijuana should be legalized for recreational use in New York? I mean, I'm just too focused on the medical side okay. right now. I have never really given any real thought mm -hmm. to the recreational issue, believe it or not. They are completely separate. Apples and oranges. Really? Oh, of course. I mean, well, when you're just the issue of med uh, recreational marijuana as compared to medical marijuana, they, those are two completely separate issues. Yes, they both come from a plant, mm -hmm. but what, we're, what we've built in Orange County and what the state is building statewide on the medical side is incredible. And like I said, we, we're not a, we can't prescribe smokable marijuana, so we are the furthest from a recreational marijuana state um, out of all the medical marijuana states, if you ask me. Fred, this has been wonderful, um, and that is the blunt truth. Thank you.